The Old Man and the Old Woman, an original short story by Jared I. McGee. Needless to say, as a rapidly aging, softening, and sagging 30-something, age is a bit of a sore spot. Nursing homes, aged family members' birthday parties, and funeral homes, these are all things that I avoid. So, when I found myself on a bus to Boston's Logan Airport, stuck next to a rather time-battered gentleman, I was a bit less than excited about the drive. A heavy-set, long-legged man of about 80, he just sat unblinking and staring into nowhere. No matter how many bumps, how many sharp turns, how many abrupt stops the bus experienced, he remained granite-faced. His unbroken stare made me begin to wonder what on earth the man could possibly be thinking about. Was he thinking of his grandparents, now gone so very long ago, and the house that they kept in the forested depths of New Hampshire, the smell of that place so potent in his memory but that he could not fully recall to save his life? Was he thinking of the horrors he faced in the jungles of Vietnam, the faces of the men he had killed swimming up from dark recesses to confront him here, in the most mundane of settings all these years later? Was he thinking back to his beloved first job at the barber shop, where he would sweep hair all day as the barber plied his craft on the heads of the townspeople of Tinston, Massachusetts, and at which he as a boy would get scant pay for, first helping him decide he would use the military as a means of getting out of Tinston and its dead-end jobs? Was he thinking back to his hundreds of sexual conquests over the years, saddened by both his ever-waning libido and the ever-waning interests of young pretty women? Was he thinking of the death of his beloved mother, the strongest woman he had ever known and the only pure love he had ever experienced? Was he thinking about the terrifying rapidity at which the modern world changed and shifted, technology driving the human race so much that he had all but lost touch with it, his obsolescence weighing heavily upon him? What was he thinking about? I continued to ponder the possibilities for the rest of the ride, through security, and well into my six-hour flight to Dublin. The blankness of his face and eyes stuck with me even further as I went to my consultancy meeting slash quasi-interview at the Facebook offices about if they needed a technical writer from the States. They did not. As I partied with old friends who had long since left the U.S. for what they felt was more kind hearts in Ireland... And, as I tossed about the evening before I was set to leave looking for a place to snag a cup of coffee and catch up on some work. The sun was readily setting, though light still defied the inevitable night, a graying hue with spots of orange brilliance hanging to everything. The waves of tourists increased as the day inched its way toward evening. After a great deal of aimless and destinationless wandering, I found one of the very few cafes still open in the Temple Bar District, the majority having closed knowing the draw of the pubs would outshine any cafe, no matter how quality the tea, how strong the coffee, or how fast the Wi-Fi. The Brick Alley Cafe, though not too terribly original in its naming, it was in a brick alley, well, a cobblestone alley anyway, but still, was quaint and kind and a fantastic place to grab a seat and continue riding. Two ladies came into the Brick Alley Cafe, ordered tea with quote-unquote loads of milk, and began looking for a place to sit. I was sitting at the window, looking out at Essex Street, watching the hustle and bustle of tourists and native Dubliners alike, all still brimming with the hope of a wild evening out in Temple Bar. As I lamented the cafes surely closing before I could bear witness to those same throngs stumbling back disappointed and alone, Navigating the treacherous cobblestone with far too much attention paid to the uneven street to have not been supping on rejection as their nightcap. Or cackling and smiling full of what is sold as traditional Irish music and traditional beer. Or brimming with licentious baring of teeth meant to be a smile, albeit a wolfish one, at their chosen liaison of the evening. The ladies who'd come in saw the two open seats beside me at the little elevated bar and made a beeline for them. 
I cursed the luck but allowed my southern upbringing to take over, saying hello and asking if I could help the older woman up. She made a crack about not being able to hop right up on a stool like she used to, thanked me, and sought my hand for the help I had offered. The old man from the bus came hobbling to the forefront of my mind, right along with my fears of time's march. This old woman, though not exactly spry, was quick to smile and was clearly out adventuring. That she was so close to Temple Bar at the close of day was almost proof in and of itself of her being something beyond what he had been. The older woman introduced herself as Ellen, and she began inquiring about where I was from, why I was in Dublin, what I did for a living, and a great many other details about my life. When her daughter came to sit down with us, carrying their two cups of tea, she introduced herself as Sheila. I came to find out that Sheila worked as a primary school teacher up in County Mayo. Ellen was over from London visiting her daughter, her home, and her heritage. Ellen regaled me with story after story of old Dublin, speaking of picnics with her mother and sisters at the base of their local round tower, of how some of the dodgier goings on in Dublin now don't begin to compare to what used to go on on the north side of the Liffey in her youth of what the priests would have thought and done if they had seen the drinking and women flowing in and out of Temple Bar. She spoke of a lifetime of change and beauty and fear and love and Ireland. Ellen and Sheila's cups of tea were long gone before our conversation ended. The night had utterly conquered the day, cloaking the area in as much darkness as is possible with so many lights from so many pubs and restaurants still beaming out in attempts to lure in the tourists. We said some parting words, all agreeing that this was quite a nice meeting indeed, and I promised to say hello to Ellen in two days' time, the coming Saturday if I saw her in the airport, the both of us being set to fly out at roughly the same time that day. A hug and a handshake later, Ellen and Sheila were washed away in the current of the foot traffic. Their smiling faces were gone, replaced by the anonymous hordes once more. I was surprised to find myself sad at their leaving, after having felt so very put out by their showing up and injecting themselves into my quiet ruminations in writing. I found myself doubly surprised when I realized at just how much of a contrast Ellen had been to my busmate from a couple weeks earlier. She was almost the brighter, more vibrant yang to his decidedly dark and depressing yin. Maybe all those philosophers had gotten the masculine versus feminine assignments for those dual aspects of reality wrong. Ellen was certainly far from dark. Instead of riding there at my chosen place of refuge, I began to pick up, opting to head out into the evening and back to my rented flat to finish my online doings. The cafe was barren now that my two friends had left me. In the spirit of those ladies, open, overt friendliness... I struck up a conversation with Maria, the barista for the establishment, as she went about filling my order for one more Americano for the road. She was from Argentina and studied English at the Liffey College. I complimented her English, paid for my to-go cup of coffee, and stepped out into the torrent, thinking that Ellen would be proud of me for reaching out and sharing in conversation with another person, rather than disappearing back into the online world via my phone or tablet. I have to travel back here while I still can, you know? Before I get old, so I can visit my family buried outside of Dublin, and not only see them again when I join them for good. Ellen had said laughing in her lilting Irish accent toward the end of our chat. What a personalized argument for carpe dieming from that dear woman. Those words clung to me as I forged into the darkness, and clamor and toward my apartment and the rest of my life. Thank you for listening to The Old Man and the Old Woman. Two of the four sound effects heard behind this story come from freesound.org. The Irish flute sound effect comes from user P. Howe. The restaurant ambience comes from user Sage Turtle. Both of these sounds from freesound.org are being used under Creative Commons CC0 1.0 Universal Public Domain Dedication Licenses. 
The remaining sound effects are originals created by me for pros. Thank you to these artists and freesound.org for making this work free and available to enhance projects such as this one. Please stay tuned for a bit of Irish history and yet another small snippet from my previous project, Thumbnail Histories.